His topic for today, ladies and gentlemen, is how to get paid to travel the world and speak. Please put your hands together, Frederick. Now, I would like to t start my speech with a quote. It's a quote from my dad. My dad was a musician and a teacher. He taught music to kids. And this is what he said about teaching music. I would like to say that this is extremely true for being a speaker. The only way you can become a speaker is being inspired by other speakers. So I am not today going to teach you how you get to do more global speeches. Instead, I will focus on the inspiration, and I think if you focus on inspiration, you talk about why. So I will talk about why you should be a global speaker. So this is me. 2000, I became a professional speaker, and I define that as since 2000, 12 years ago, I have done nothing but being paid to speak, and writing books. It's the only thing I do. It was, before that, it was a hobby. I did it on the side. I got paid once in a while. But the last 12 years, I've been doing it full time and doing nothing else. In 2000, um, I did uh, roughly 30 speeches. And one was in Sweden and one was abroad. And that's where you start. Now, 12 years later, this is where I am. I do about 80 to 150 speeches per year, depending if I'm writing a book or not writing a book. Last year I did 79, the year before that I did 144. This year I'm doing 48 speeches outside Singapore. Now the good thing with being in Singapore is very easy to do overseas speeches, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to live in, Nor I used to live in North, North Dakota in America, and then it's a different thing. So it's easy to be a global speaker based in Singapore. This is 48, it's up to today. The last one I did was in Dubai two days ago. I'm already booked for another 15 or so for the year, so I'm guessing roughly 65 overseas speeches this year. Now, my goal with my 40 minutes is that you are going to feel that regardless how many you have done today, even if it's zero, you are going to say, if he can do that, I can, if he can do that in 12 years, I can do that too. And I would like to challenge you that you're not going to do it in 12 years. I'm going to challenge you how you do it in six years, which is half what I did. Well, as you heard, I've spoken in 45 countries, and here they are. Obviously, I need to go to South America, and I'm planning to do that soon. Okay, so let's begin. Why should you speak globally? Then let's look at it on a more fundamental way. Let's look at it like this. Why do you speak? There must be a reason for why you choose to have this extremely unusual job of standing in front of a bunch of people telling them how you look at the world. It's not for everyone. So anyone here who already is a speaker, can you give me a few examples? Why do you speak? Anyone? Let's start. Why do you speak? Um, almost because I have to. OK. It, it, it comes out. <laughs> it's that or jail for you, right? It's that or jail. Yeah, OK. Yeah, just have, OK. It, it's, my raison d'etre. Good. It's you're born to do it. I think you're right. I think you're born to do it. Why do you speak? Uh, I love helping people. Huh? Yeah. I love helping people. That's a great reason to be a speaker. Okay. Now, we look at why I speak. So here are a few reasons. Actually, I decided to cut them short, depending on what we could put fit, fit into this speech. But these are the four reasons I speak. And they are in order of importance. The most important reason why I speak is for inspiration. And that's both, both ways. It's that I want to live a life where I get inspired. And to be a speaker, it's perfect because you get inspired on a daily basis. On the other hand, I also like to inspire other people. So it's a give and take. And do you, as a speaker, you get both, which is wonderful. The second reason that I like to be a speaker is to learn. I like to be challenged, to always, like you were saying, always need to be on the ball, know what's going on, because they are going to sit there with their mobile phone and they're going to check you. So you have to learn all the time. And the opposite of that, of course, is to teach. If you like to learn, you also usually like to teach. And as a speaker, you do both. The third, the third two reasons I put up there, I put the last one with money because there are a lot of people, when they look at speakers and they look at how much speakers charge, they think that's a motivator. I, it is for me, and I should say that right now. 
<coughs> it is for me because that's how I make my living. I could speak, I could be a speaker and not charge. I think everyone who is a speaker said, I can't believe they're paying me to do this, right? <laughs> I would like to pay to do this. And by the way, when I moved to, I moved to Asia six years ago, I moved, I moved to Beijing, and Beijing then had a very, let's say, immature speaker market. And I remember I came to Beijing about six years ago, and I met an event organizer, and we were talking about fees. So they were all like, I was going to be the speaker, that was all clear. I was keynote speaker, the date was set, the subject, everything was set. And then we came to the fees and they said, how about 20,000 RMB? Are you comfortable with that? And I went 20,000, well, it's a little bit less than I normally charge, but it's okay. I just came to China and I said, yeah, I'm fine with that. They said, great, can you pay within a week? <laughs> I go, what? Oh, you want me to pay you 20,000 RMB so that I can speak. So why on earth do you think I'm going to pay to speak? And they say, this is China. Okay, that's how it is. They saw it as a way for me to promote my ideas and get fu future business in, you know, and so on. They want me to pay. And that's how you should look at speaking. But if you do it full time, you have to make money doing it. Otherwise, you have better have a big fortune to live on or a very nice wife, okay? <laughs> the third one is not why I am a speaker. It's why I have chosen any kind of job because I look at it this way. If I'm going to have a job, I'm going to have a job that in itself makes my life more fulfilling and richer. I spent eight one third of my life sleeping and I can't do anything about that. I have one third of my life, a little bit more than that, as free time. And that's when you go on holiday and you play with your kids and all that. But you have one third of your life where you work. When most people look at work, at those eight hours I need to get money so I can do the fun stuff on my free time. I don't subscribe to that. If I'm going to have a job, it has to be a job which in itself I could do full time 16 hours per day. Because it's so fulfilling and so rich. And that's why I am a speaker. That's how I find my inspiration. Now, this is why I speak. And the reason is, if you're a global speaker, all of those things gets magnified. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to spend some time here talking about how these advantages of being a speaker gets magnified by being a global speaker. And I am going to use myself as an example. So here we go. Let's start from the other way. Let's go from the least important to the most important. How about money? Well, you should be a speak global speaker because you will make more money than if you're not. That's how it is. If you speak for an international audience and they are having a global conference or something, they are willing to pay you more. How much more? At least 20 to 50 percent more. At least 20 to 50 percent more. So I went back in my invoice file and I said, what is the most I've been charging in the last 12 months? 30,000 K for one hour. $30,000 per hour. There are extremely few professionals across any industry who's charging more than that. Now, please don't get this wrong. I don't charge 30,000 every time. <laughs> I wish I did and I soon will, I hope, but I don't. But I do once in the last 12 months. Here's the thing, if, you don't not, if you're not a speaker, I have to explain to you how speaking industry works. It's supply and demand. If you take 100 people, 99% of them hate to stand right here. It's, an, it's like a phobia, they don't like to do that. Which means, from the start, you're down to 1% of mankind who can be speakers. <laughs> now, you take that 1% and you now you have 100 p per people of this 1%. Now they have to have something interesting to say. There are a lot of people who are great speakers at dinner parties. They can never be co professional speakers. They just don't have a subject that someone is, is willing to pay for at a company. Only 1 in 100 do. There are many more dinner speakers than there are professional speakers. If you are a great dinner speaker, but you're not a professional speaker, usually that's because you don't have your subject yet. For God's sake, find your subject. It can be anything. You can become an expert on this subject, and then you are a professional speaker, and you can start charging for it. But one in a hundred. So that means a hundred of a hundred can be a professional speaker. 
Now, the problem with those 100 people, if you take 100 of them, is that only one in a hundred of them want to be a professional speaker. <laughs> Steve Jobs was a great speaker, yes or no? Yes. Steve Jobs knew his subjects, yes or no? Yes. But he didn't want to be a professional speaker, did he? No, he was busy doing other things, yes? And that's the truth. So only one in a hundreds of one in a hundreds in one in a hundreds wants to be a professional speaker and can do it. Now, out of those 100, only one in a hundred can be a global speaker. Now, you do the math. And that's why you can charge this much. <laughs> <clears throat> but that is just an explanation. That's not the reason. The reason you can charge this much is because if you organize a global conference for 500 people who are going to fly in from 500 different cities around the world to one conference place, which is so nice that these people would like to be away for five days from their wives and husbands, <laughs> you do the math. How much does those, all those trips cost? How much does all those hotels cost? How much does the, the, the video equipment, the PowerPoints, the coffee, the, the buffet, the excursions, how much does all of that cost? And you see, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. And now one of those speakers during the day is going to be a keynote speaker. The rest are going to be internal speakers and they are free. You have one cost for one person and that's in the beginning of the day or the end of the day and that's to lighten them up in the beginning or get, let them move, go out at the end of the afternoon inspired and happy. Now if you organize this conference and it's your career on the line and you've just spent a hundred, few hundred thousand organizing this and at the end of the evaluation they say the speaker was bad. Your career is gone. And that's why you're willing to take so much of your money to, put, to make sure that that person at the end is so good that everyone liked the conference and everyone thinks you did a good job and you get the promotion. That's what they're paying for. And they pay more for global speakers because global conferences are more expensive to set up. Now, some people will say, oh, but I don't want to travel because I, you know, I want to be home with my family. And I totally think that's a great reason not to be a global speaker all the time. But here's the thing. If you can charge 50% more, you can spend 50% more time at home with your family. When I lived in Sweden, I did 199 speeches in one year. That's one per working day, every day around the world. Today, I don't do that. Last year, I did 79 but I make more money today than when I did 199. And I have four months per year off with my family. As a global speaker, you have more time with your family, not less. Okay. Now, second reason you should be a, a, a speaker, just simple, you get a more, you get a richer life. So here are some pictures just to, to, to get you inspired, hopefully, or maybe pissed off, I don't know. <laughs> This is in June, a client for two days offering me two speeches in three days, paying hotel for three days. This is the view from my hotel in Barcelona, which meant a free Barcelona weekend for me. This is a speech in Ukraine, and it happened to be the same day that Sweden was playing <laughs> England in Euro Cup 2012. Now, if that is not a perk, I don't know what is. This, is also, this was also in June. This is also in June. This is a speech in Pakistan, three speeches in three Pakistani uh, cities in four days, including a trip up to the mountain with the other speakers having an inspiring dinner in the mountains of Pakistan. An amazing trip. And talking about family, this is a speech in Bali, where I organized with, the, with, with the, the, the organizers. I said, I'll come, but I will only come if you also pay for my wife's ticket and pay for two extra nights in the hotel. And suddenly, we had a free Bali vacation with my family, and I worked one hour out of that four days in Bali. <laughs> That's why you should be a global speaker. There's nothing wrong with going to Sentosa and doing a speech five days per week. You can do a great life like that, and you can. It's nothing wrong with that, but it's more enriching to travel around the world and do speeches, and the perks are just better. Now. Here are the true reasons why you should be a global speaker. And the first one is, you learn more. So I'd like to share with you a few people that I have interviewed during the last couple of months. First one is this guy, Charles Doyle. He's the global head of marketing at Jones Lance LaSalle, which is the largest property company in the world. 
because I was speaking at their global conference and so was he. So I interviewed him for my upcoming book about how John Klang Sassal is a global company. This is the global CEO of SKF, a big bearings company. From, uh, I met with him during the dinner at the conference they had for 700 partners of SKF in Asia, where he sat down with me for one hour, telling me how he is trying to transform SKF from a Swedish company into a global company. That's one hour with a corporate CEO of one of the largest companies in the world. Now you try sending an email to a CEO saying, hi, I would like to sit down with you for one hour, have lunch with you, and learn from you. They won't give you the time. But if you are the speaker at their conference, they will happily do exactly that. This is the CEO of Twitter. A couple of months back, I'm doing a speech in San Francisco, and the four speakers were me, global CEO of Twitter, global marketing director of Facebook, global marketing director of Google. I was the only one who got paid. <laughs> now here's the thing, when you do a speech, they put you at the speaker's table, which means you give exchange card to this guy, you say, can I talk to you later, can I do an interview, and I got to interview him, also for my book. And by the way, this is the book. It's being released later this year, it's called One World, One Company, and the subtitle is how an how some of the best companies in the world are becoming global and why you should too, including you. This is of course mainly written for big multinational companies because I go to them and say, you have 145,000 employees, you're trying to become global, I think you need to buy one copy for every employee. So, <laughs> okay, that's the goal with this book. But it is equally applicable on you. You should never say that you are a Singaporean speaker. You should hardly even say that you are a Singapore-based speaker. You should say that you are a speaker. Or more importantly, maybe you should say, you, I'm a health, I want to get people, I'm a speaker who talks on this. I'm a self-leadership speaker. I am a creativity speaker. That's what you are. Your nationality is irrelevant and you should stop putting that in front of you. Now here's the thing. For this book, I have been traveling to 15 different countries interviewing high senior level managers of global companies and I didn't pay a single dollar in traveling expense. Everything has been paid by other people. Even if I go and interview the global ma the marketing director of Philips and I didn't do a speech for them, I happened to do a speech in Amsterdam and they are in Amsterdam, so I send an email to them saying, I'm in Amsterdam, can I meet with you? As we heard, experts is anyone who knows something. If you're going to be a speaker, it is not enough to sit in your office in Singapore and Google some nice stories on the internet, put that together in a book and try to sell it. No one's going to buy books like that. No one. That market is dead. But a book about how this author himself or herself went around and interviewed smart people to give information that these people have not said already on the internet that market is still there. And that's what people are going to pay for. And you just learn more. Now, in this book, I tell a story. The story is about an Icelandic word which is called heimskur. The cool thing with the Icelandic language, it's the same language as a thousand years ago. It's Viking language. You can take an Icelandic book that's 1,000 years old and you can read it and you understand it if you know Icelandic today. You try that with English. <laughs> Doesn't work. Even Shakespeare is difficult and that's not 1,000 years ago. But Icelandic is exactly the same. <coughs> now the Icelandic people have a word and the word is heimskir. What, it, what does it come from? It comes from the word home. Heim, home, heimskir. Now, if you were an Icelandic Viking, you had a farm, you were supposed to build a ship, a Viking ship, and then you were supposed to take other guys that you could find on this island, put them on your ship and sail south. And you're supposed to sail down to Europe and you're supposed to steal everything that you could. You know, gold, silver, weapons. But more importantly, you're supposed to steal ideas. 
You're supposed to say, how do they farm in France? How do they make gold in Turkey? How do they celebrate religion in, and so on? You're supposed to pick up the best ideas you can find while traveling and supposed to take that back to your farm in Iceland. If you didn't do that, you were a heimskur. Heimskur means moron. <laughs> Singapore is an amazing place to live. I can live anywhere in the world as a creativity author and speaker, literally anywhere, but I choose to live in Singapore because I think it's a wonderful place to live if you want to have a global mindset. But it doesn't help. If you just live in Singapore, if you just speak in Singapore, you will become a Himskir. <laughs> okay. So here's the main number one reason for why you should be a global speaker, and that's because of inspiration. So let me just share a few examples of the things that have inspired me as a speaker in the last few months. This was in, Ir Oops. This was in Iran, at a university. This is actually quite a while ago, but I like this story. I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> but two years ago. I'm in Iran doing a speech, and they ask me, oh, Frederick, would you like to do a speech at the Women University? I go, yeah, cool. In the taxi, the translator asked me, oh, by the way, it's all women. Can you handle it? I go, yeah. I go into this university, and I come, and I see this. It's all women, and all except two of them are dressed exactly the same. <laughs> the title of my speech, The Value of Doing Things Differently. <laughs> but if anyone who's been to Iran knows, Iran is one of the most amazing countries in the world. Highly educated people, know three or four languages, and super cool people. And it's so inspiring to go and see the, how your image of a country is totally turned upside down. Have you been to Iran? Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't you agree? Pakistan, same thing. North Korea, same thing. You travel and you see that the picture that you have of the world is just not true. This is a totally different kind. This is me speaking in Cannes in June this year for Mayan Chair. Now Cannes is 10,000 advertising people from around the world. An amazing conference. Now here's the thing, if you're on stage, that means everyone comes and talks to you. You don't need a bench to sit on. The stage is the bench to sit on. It means, hi, I'm here, come and play with me. Everyone cl comes and plays with you. The people who played with me was the global marketing director of Coca-Cola, came up and talked to me. The global head of Nike Digital, the ones who does this, the fuel band, came up to talk to me. The minister of trade of Sweden, that's not so famous, but anyway comes up and talk to me. That's the thing. When you're a global speaker in a global conference, the people who are not speaking are brilliant, but the people who are in the audience are equally interesting. And they come up to you because you're the guy with the mic. But this is the most inspiring that happened to me about six months ago when I'm doing a speech in Cebu in the Philippines. And as part of the conference, they decide we should go out on a little excursion. And the excursion is to the most popular tourist attraction in Cebu, which is the prison. <laughs> and I see this. Absolutely amazing. I mean, this YouTube video has 52 million hits on it, but that's not the YouTube video, that's my video. To see it live is a totally different thing. This is prisoners in the Philippines dancing like Michael Jackson, not because they're forced to, because they want to. And it's an example of how you can totally run a prison in a totally different way, and how by making the prisoners dance, the prison became much less violent. And today the prisoners are not locked up in cells anymore, they are free to roam around in the prison all day long, only locked up during the night. What a wonderful story about how the most 
violent prison in the Philippines became the least violent prison in the Philippines. And now I use this story when I do talks about how any industry can be changed by looking at things differently. That's how you learn. That's how you get inspiration as a speaker. Okay, so that was why you should be a global speaker. Now let's quickly at the end, let's look at how. And if you heard me speak before about how to be a speaker, you know to be a speaker is an extremely simple exercise. All you have to do is this. Do a good speech. <laughs> That's true for how to be a speaker. It's even more true to be a global speaker. Remember what I said. If you do one global speech per year in six years, you're going to do more than me. This is how you do it. Year one, you do a great speech. And after that speech, two people come up to you and say, Oh, this is amazing. Can you come to us and speak? And you say yes. Next year, you do two speeches. Two people come up afterwards and say, that was an amazing speech. Can you come to us and speak? And you say yes. Six years from now, you do 64 global speeches. And the only thing you have to do is do a good speech. No marketing, no videos, no Twitter, no Facebook, no nothing, all right? Not even business cards. Take their business card. That's how you do it. That's the only way you do it. And if you're a speaker and two people do not come up to you afterwards, you should only focus on one thing, and that's how to do a better speech. <laughs> so I'm going to prove to you that this is true. This is me, and these all are all examples from this month, September, before this month, 2012. September 5, I did a speech for KPMG in Thailand. The reason I did that was because this woman was in the audience when I did a speech for the, for the Asia partner conference of KPMG in Sydney. And she came up afterwards uh, during the dinner and said, this is amazing, we have to bring you to Thailand. During this speech, three people came up after me and booked me on the spot, including one from Myanmar, which means a new country on my list in a couple of weeks from now. This is me in Singapore for a global audience, for Cognizant. After the speech, four people come up, head of Cognizant in Hong Kong, global HR director of Cognizant, all these between themselves booking me for free speeches on the spot. This is a speech in Beijing that I did for Praxity, which is a global accounting firm. I did that because the person who booked me was married to a person who heard me speak at another conference. <laughs> they don't have to hear you directly, they just need to go on recommendation. Two people from India and one from America booked me on the spot. This is me two days ago in Dubai for MEC. The reason I was there is because the guy sitting there heard me speak at a global MEC conference and said, you have to come to Dubai. After the speech, the head of Young and Rubicon, the head of Barston Merstellar, and the head of an Abu Dhabi company came out and booked me on the spot. Now, please note what I just told you. Three people came up. That means if you do that, you triple the number of speeches that you do in a year. Then it won't take you six years, it's going to take you three years to get to 64. Now, not all of these are going to come through. Because they book me and say, we want you to come. I say, sure, give me your card, here's my card. And I don't even follow up, okay? That's how bad I am. <laughs> Which means usually only one in three actually make, become something because they call me and say, you have to come, why aren't you calling us? That is because I only focus on doing great speeches. I don't want to do more speeches than I do now. I have reached my limit. I'm happy with the speeches I have. I just need one speech for every speech I do, and I'm self-sufficient. But if you just call the two people who gave you a business card, you double them. This is why you have to speak globally. That's my two final slides. All the ones I did before was why it's nice to be a global speaker, why it's more enriching to be a global speaker, why you make more money, why you learn more, why you're more inspired. But these are all nice reasons. Here's a cru crucial reason, and if you don't do that, you won't be a speaker. There are two things happening in the world right now that we absolutely have to understand as speakers. And if we do, we will realize that the future as a speaker is brilliant. And here are the two things. First of all, the growth of Asia. Now, of course, you cannot live in this part of the world and not understand what the growth of Asia means. But here's why this is important for you. I, I've lost count on the number of times that I sit in a global conference and the CEO got, goes up and says, we have 2% growth in America, we have 1% growth in Europe, and we're going to double in Asia in five years. 
That's how it is, regardless of industry. Nike, Linde Gas, John Slans LaSalle, KPNG, they all say the same. This is where the growth is going to happen. Now you ask yourself this, if you're a global CEO of a company and all of the growth is going to be here and all of the profit is going to come from here, where are you going to invest your money? Where are you going to put your global conference? Did you notice that the, the account, global accounting firm had their global conference in Beijing? The next one is going to be in India. They are now putting global conferences in this part of the world for two reasons. One, it's now conference places big enough to put them here. And two, everyone wants to understand what happens in Asia. Which means they are going to put the global conferences here. Mean more global conferences here. Mean speaker needed for those conferences. And here's the second reason why it's a beautiful time to be a speaker based in Asia right now. And this is called Asian conferences. Asian conferences is just like the one I told you, the KPMG Asia Partners. I, I recently, in December last year, I did a speech for HP Asia Conference. For the first time ever, HP had an Asian conference at Marina Bay Sands for 5,000 people. I said, this is amazing. Where were you last year? Because the sands just opened. They said, we, this is the first time we do this. We've never had a, an Asian conference before. And that's for two reasons. Reason number one, just until about last year, they didn't have Asian conferences because Asian people were not good enough in English. Which meant if you're going to have an Asian conference, you needed 20 re, uh, translators. It's like the European Union. <laughs> Now, you figure out the cost of that. Two translators per language, 20 languages, that's 40 translators, plus the booth and the, the things to listen to, and more importantly, in the breaks, they couldn't talk to each other. So what's the purpose of having a nation conference? They just didn't have them. Now they're good enough in English, meaning they are now having, even the, the, the Taiwanese and the Koreans are good enough in English, so what they do now, for the first time, they do Asian conferences. HP did it for the first time last year, and they will now continue to do so. That means 5,000 HP people who not now need speakers. So here we are. More global conferences being put in Asia, more Asian conferences happening for the first time. What does that mean? It means a lot more money invested in conferences where they put a lot of money into those conferences. And that means professional speakers. And the good thing is, they can't fly in the Americans. <laughs> because the Americans don't know shit about this part of the world. And they... You must have arrived late. I'm talking about you. We, I said you can't fly them in. I said, you can't fly in the Europeans either because they don't know shit of what's happening here. Which means you're left, what you want is a speaker who knows about Asia. And here's a newsflash, unless you didn't notice, there are extremely few professional speakers in Asia. Much fewer than in Europe and much fewer in Asia per capita. And 60% of the world population and all of the growth is going to be in this part of the world. Now where would you like to be a professional speaker? Obviously you should be it here, but you will only get that job if you have spoken not only in Singapore, but you have spoken for accountants in Thailand, for, 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 uh, for a gas company in Bali, for a real estate company in Hong Kong, and for a bank in Taiwan. If you have done that, they are going to say to you, oh, you know about all these different cultures, and you've spoken to all these different cultures. So that means that you can speak at our global conference, and you know about Asia because you've been living here for two years, four years, six years, your whole life. They are going to pick you. If you think American speakers are the one who gets paid the most, that's not true anymore. American speakers are making less and less money. The speakers who will make most money in the world from now and the next five to ten years are the Asian-based speakers. That's why you should be a global speaker based in Asia. So you have no excuse. Just go out and do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes? Diverting from Pakistan, so this. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it doesn't interest me, but a couple of questions. I just want to know, as an experienced speaker, what are the typical topics you speak on? I assume you have a handful of keynotes which you focus on, and also, how, when you started first, your first keynote, what or initial days, what did you speak on, and how did you choose that? Okay, so I, the first I, I started speaking in 1995, so the first five years I was not a professional speaker. I was then speaking on the internet. 2000 I started speaking full time, and since then I've been speaking on creativity. It's creativity and innovation. Uh, so my keynotes are creativity, creativity in the developing world. Uh, you can say creativity in customer service, but I, not so often. And then my new topic, which is global companies, which has nothing to do with creativity, but since I travel so much, I just had to write this book about how some companies are becoming more and more global. And that's my most sought after speech now. So I'm actually doing two things, uh, innovation and global companies. Um, you talk about having a good speech, right, or a great speech. Again, okay, based on your experience, what's one or two tips you could share with us which make, from your perspective, a good or a great speech that has people come up to you. But what makes a great speech is that you do it over and over again, right? This is the first time I did this speech. If I, if I did the, do this speech 20 times, do you think it's going to be better? Obviously, it's going to be so much better, right? And that's why you need to have your, that's why I talked before, the key keynote speech. You have a few, you do them over and over and over again until you're, it's so good because you changed small things about how you say things, right? And, and then you add new things, of course, but that's the thing. Just practice, practice, practice. Yes? I think what I want to ask, is the same question I want to ask. You obviously know how to make, uh, deliver a quality speech that makes it stand out from the rest. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours, I've been watching you speak all the time. And what makes it, make it uh, so great that people want to refer you or hire you again? You obviously know what formula to put into your speech. No, uh, th when I go up, I don't know if I did that today, no, I didn't. But normally when I go up, I write an abbreviated version of this. Say what you believe and believe what you say. That's what I write down, always when I go up. Every time I do a bad speech, it's either because I didn't sound like I meant what I said, or I started saying things I didn't really believe in. These are always the bad speeches. If you focus on those two things, they will, tell, they will feel that you're genuine and you're actually passionate about this subject, and they will... They don't care if you say, oh, mm, ah, they don't care if you move around. They don't care of anything as long as you're genuine and they feel that this guy really believes what he's saying. And he's saying in a, w in a way that makes it feel believable. You need to be both of those. Then you're fine. That's the most important one. Can I, uh, can I just share? I, I was sitting with a buyer of speakers today, um, in fact, hopefully to be hired myself, but I was talking about Frederick. And the buyer of speakers said, Frederick is the most authentic speaker in Asia. And I went, oh. I wish you'd said that about me. <laughs> <laughs> so the most authentic speaker in There you go. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> One second. We do women's first. Yes? Okay. So, Frederick, who do you find the decision makers are to book you? Is it HR? Is it sales? Is it via... No. It doesn't work like that. Ne the one who comes up after your speech. That's the decision maker. But Then book one speech at the bridge chamber for free. Okay. And 50 people come, and those 50 people are going to say, that's amazing, can you come to our company? And you say, yeah, and that's your decision. That's not the decision maker, that's the one who goes to the decision maker. And now you, you ask yourself, that's, like a, that's a difference, that's a dating. If I go up to a girl and I says, hey, I'm really great, you should marry me, that usually doesn't work. But if your girlfriend says, that guy over there, he's really good. You should marry him. And she, you're much more interested. So you should never sell yourself. You should do great speeches. And other people say, you, you need to book this guy. And then they go on YouTube and they find some video you posted there so that they, get some, that they believe that what, what that per person said. And you're booked. If you start thinking decision makers and all that, you're, you're off focus. Focus is do a great speech. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Perfect.